All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our program. Tonight we will be meeting author Stefan Al, who will be talking to us about his book, Super Tall, How the World's Tallest Buildings Are Reshaping Our Cities and Our Lives. My name is Helen Liu, and I'm the Programming and Partnerships Manager at Cary Library. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to thank the Cary Library Foundation for their support, which enables us to bring programs like tonight's event to you. I also want to thank the public libraries in Belmont, Canton, Needham, Maynard, and Newton for partnering with us on this program. This program is being recorded and will be posted to the library's YouTube channel. If you have any questions, please submit them to the Q&A and we will answer them at the end of the program. I am so excited to introduce our speaker. Sifem Al is an architect, urban designer, author, and educator. Early on, he co-designed the winning design of the 2,000 feet tall Canton Tower in 2010, briefly the world's largest tower. Upon its construction as a senior associate principal at global firm KPF, he contributed to the design of mixed-use projects and high-rise towers in the US and Asia. He recently started his own design practice and his work has been exhibited in cultural venues worldwide, including the Venice Biennale. In addition, he served as an advisor to various city governments, including Hong Kong, a TED resident and a professor at Virginia Tech and Columbia University. His latest book, Super Tall, was commended by the New York Times Book Review as a thoughtful inquiry into the new generation of skyscrapers. Please join me in welcoming Stefan L. Yeah, thank you very much, Helen, and thank you, Carrie Library, for the invitation. Uh, very, very excited to uh, to be here and, and and talk about the book. I could I could talk about skyscrapers for hours, uh, but don't worry, we're 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 just going on uh, one hour right now. So, how does this how did this book um, come about? Well, uh, it's it's partially because of my interest in, in skyscrapers, because I was trained as, a, as an architect and I worked on some very tall buildings, uh, mostly in Asia, but also in the US. Uh, but on top of that, I'm, I'm also a, a researcher. I have a PhD in city planning and I've been really interested in how cities are transforming, particularly you know, very large global cities. And the, the skyscraper is really part of that. So I wanted to tell uh, that story about the skylines of our biggest cities, the technology that makes them possible, but also the urban planning that makes them uh, viable and livable. So I, I want to be talking about that uh, today. And the book begins by talking about one of the world's most famous architects, Frank Lloyd Wright, who about 70 years ago imagined a mile high skyscraper. Now, Today, we may not think that is so outrageous, but back then, uh, it, the project raised a lot of eyebrows. Uh, people were extremely skeptical that we you know, could, but also should, should we build uh, that high? Uh, and for very, very valid reasons. You know, elevators didn't go fast enough, right? Proposed atomic powered elevators that would bring people up. Concrete wasn't strong enough. Uh, but most importantly, people were not moving to the city. Uh, this was part of a nationwide post-war suburban exodus. So the timing was completely off. But if you look today, the last 20 years, we really see uh, a worldwide uh, building boom of skyscrapers taller than 200 meters and, and three, 300 meters. Uh, and 300 meters is kind of a symbolic number. It, kind of refers back to almost the height of the Empire State Building. So today we have uh, more than 100 uh, of such buildings that are taller than 300 meters, and which is the classical definition of a super tall building. Uh, and not only that, we have uh, buildings that are close to a kilometer length. Uh, and very soon we may see the, the mouth. Now, also, if you look at the geographic distribution of these very tall towers, uh, it's no longer an America story. It's really a global story with, above all, I should say, uh, Asia and 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 really uh, head and shoulders, literally above the rest, is uh, is China. So it's it's gone from the U.S. with the tallest buildings, think the Empire State Building and the Chrysler Building in the 20th century, to today 
uh, countries like China, which which have the vast major majority of, of tall buildings. Um, so the tallest right now is uh, close to 3,000 feet. There's one plan that's even taller than 3,000 feet. So who knows? We may see the mall. And the skyscrapers are also appearing in cities where we would never have expected them. Places like London and Paris, which are traditionally low-rise cities where, you know, for centuries the skyline was defined by old monuments like in London the St Paul's Cathedral now what is to now how do we explain all of this now of course now part of the explanation is uh, technology and the book goes on for instance on the on the history of cement and concrete and how it's gotten ever uh, stronger so if, if you just compare the compressive strength, for instance, of concrete in the 1950s, and you, which is probably enough to, to support like a 30, 40, maybe 50 story building. Today, uh, we're really talking about, you know, half a kilometer, uh, which is getting uh, very, very feasible. But on top of that is also uh, a change of lifestyle preferences among people and, and kind of about eight years ago was the first time in history that we've become a global or, or an urban species, I should say, with more than 50% of the world's population living in cities. Obviously, this urbanization data uh, on numbers changes per country. Um, and the United States and Japan have already been you know, very heavily urbanized. But the places like uh, China, for instance, have seen and India have seen a very large urban uptick. Uh, so that also partially explains the need for more compact forms of, of buildings like skyscrapers. But that's not the entire story. Uh, so the, the other part of the story is that there's really a new generation of skyscrapers that's a little geometrically more uh, sophisticated, you could say. And, and, and that is also quite significant. So for instance, about 100 years ago, Vladimir Shukov, who was a Russian engineer, he planned for a very uh, advanced geometry, the so-called hyperboloid, which you see on the left side. Uh, and, and he planned to be, world, be the world's, uh, or to, to design the world's tallest tower. It was gonna be taller than the, the Eiffel Tower. The interesting part was his geometry, which was really, quite sophisticated and something that hadn't been seen at that height. Uh, and it was more advanced than the arches and trusses of the Eiffel Tower. It was more um, in a way sophisticated because the lines that you're seeing, those diagonals, uh, they go all the way down straight in each section. Uh, and that is a very efficient way of distributing the load. Now, the problem was that um, the regime at the time ran out of steel. So they weren't able to build it taller than the Eiffel Tower. It was only uh, you know, half, half that size. But nevertheless, had it been built uh, at, the, at the height of the Eiffel Tower, it would have only had to use 2,000 tons over 7,000 tons. Now, you can imagine our surprise when we, as a very young design firm in Amsterdam about 15 years ago, were competing for uh, what was then the world's tallest tower. And we proposed kind of going back to Shukov, a hyperboloid structure uh, that was going to be 600 meters or, or 2,000 feet. Um, and it, it wasn't just going to be taller. It was also geometrically more sophisticated in that it had a twist uh, because there was a bottom ellipse that had a different direction than, than the top ellipse. And what's nice about that, it, it gave it kind of an asymmetric um, profile that made it look different from every side of uh, in the in the city where normally tv towers that kind of look the same no matter where you are in the city but to our <laughs> and and here you see that kind of asymmetrical uh, uh look because of the the waist that has a thin side and a thick side uh, but to our surprise we ended up winning the competition and we ended up building this uh design and uh, you know why were we able to to build this more kind of sophisticated geometry? It's really because the technology had evolved. So we were able to uh, calculate and, uh, and and using kind of digital design techniques, uh, 
to minimize the number of nodes, which you're seeing here, which are very expensive to, to build. At the same time, we're able to, to calculate the wind flows, making sure and showing the client that the project would hold up. Um, so because of these advances in computational design, but also in new manufacturing technologies, we were able to, to build this very sophisticated geometry that was unheard of maybe 100 years ago to this extreme height. Uh, and in contrast from typical TV towers, this one's hollow and you can actually experience it on the, on the inside. Um, and here you see the, the main architect of one of the skyboxes uh, up there. But the story really is that, you know, where, where, where towers used to kind of follow more conventional and stable outlines, uh, now, because of new technologies, we can really uh, also change the aesthetics of, uh, of towers. So our tower is one in a host of twisting towers, for instance. Uh, and twisting towers may, makes not just aesthetic sense, but also uh, aerodynamic sense because it kind of disturbs the wind pattern and avoids uh, kind of the wind sucking on the building, which could be quite dangerous. Uh, there's even towers that aim to defy gravity, like leaning towers, which is um, the, uh, the building on the left, the Capitol Gate in Abu Dhabi, which is the, uh, has the Guinness Book of World Records of the um, most leaning building, three times more than the leaning tower of Pisa. And most of all, this is delivered. But look at the CCTV headquarters in Beijing by Omei, for instance, which also has a huge cantilever. This is very un... un heard of in terms of structural engineering or the, or the town on the right, which seems to be eroding. So our towers are becoming increasingly uh, different from kind of the old towers with, with their stable uh, outlines. And we're even seeing towers that are being interconnected with, with sky bridges and, and roof decks. Uh, and we even have towers, for instance, here in New York, that are extremely skinny. Uh, the most skinny of them all is the one on the left, which is 23 times taller than it is wide. That's why we also call them uh, pencil towers. So the book goes on about kind of explaining the technology, what makes them feasible. Uh, but then it also talks about how skyscrapers are manifested very differently in each city. And I think it's a, that's important because you know, ultimately, it's not just people who live in the in the skyscrapers that uh, you know value good design. It's because the skyscraper is so large, it has an impact on the rest of the city. So, how do urban planners minimize that impact? Uh, and in fact, how can they try to use skyscrapers as a as a positive thing? So, I just want to show you four examples uh, from cities around the world: Hong Kong, New York, Singapore, and Vancouver. So Hong Kong is unique because it combines real and the real network and, and high-rise systems. So I remember the very first time I, I went to Hong Kong and I was completely overwhelmed. It felt like a complete uh, concrete jungle. It's the city with the most amount of skyscrapers, about 2,000 in total, uh, more than twice the amount of New York City. Uh, but very soon I came to realize that the city actually is quite organized and quite uh, logical. Of course, what's very bizarre about the city is that the skyscrapers virtually have no setbacks. So unlike New York City, where there also always space between the sidewalk and, and the skyscrapers here, they can sometimes really literally almost hit, uh, hit the road. So it's, it's quite congested. Um, so, so for sure, you know, this is why Hong Kong has been epitomized maybe as the ultimate outcome of urbanization as this center of extreme density. Uh, think about Bellard and his novel uh, High Rise in which he talks about the kind of mental uh, anxiety that, that is associated with boxing people in, in tall buildings. Uh, but after I lived there for a couple of years, and, and I, I found out uh, relatively soon already, and I lived in these uh, different towers around the city, I came to realize the city really works like clockwork. There's virtually no 
traffic congestion uh, in the city, for instance. How does that work? How, how has the city achieved that? Now, if you look at this image, and I remember going here first, you're standing here, not on the ground, but you're on top of a, a train station. And then above the train station is when you have where you have these towers. So this is extremely convenient for people. Uh, you know, I live here in one of these towers for a while. Let's say I want to go to the airport. I can just go down an elevator, uh, walk for a couple minutes, take an escalator, and and I'm at uh, the train track. From from there, 20 minutes, I'm at the I'm at the airport. So it's a very interesting urban form. And how what has this uh, occurred. Well, the interesting thing about Hong Kong is that it has a transit authority at the MTRC that's also a real estate developer. So it can capitalize on the land appreciation it creates. So every time it builds a, a subway stop, it acquires the, the area above the subway stop at a favorable rate from uh, the government of Hong Kong so that it then can, uh, can build real estate on top. Um, and this this model of property plus real, as they also call it, is uh, very successful. So as a result, you know the MTRC is one of the fewer transit authorities that actually makes a profit. The trains, they go on time, there's air conditioning, there's Wi-Fi. Uh, it's very different from the subways that we're used to in, in other cities. Um, so here you see, for instance, one of the tallest buildings, uh, the ICC is built right on top of that transit station, Kowloon station. So this has become a development model across the, across the city. Uh, and the beauty of this system is that 90% of all transit, all, all, all trips uh, going from A to B are done by public transit. Because it is so easy to get into the subways, because all the density, all the tall buildings are as, literally connected to subway stations, uh, that makes it very, very easy to go uh, from, from A to B throughout the city. So you can get to virtually all, anywhere within the city within like 40, 40 minutes, which is quite um, amazing. So if we're looking at this graph, which explains the relationship between the urban density and transport-related energy consumption, we're looking at Hong Kong, which is on one end of the spectrum, and then cities like Houston and Phoenix, which lies on the other end of the spectrum. Why are places like dense places like Hong Kong have a very low per uh, capita energy consumption? It's because of public transportation and walking. In Houston, Phoenix, you really need to drive. Uh, the area is too big for the, the city to build uh, like a good transit system, like a subway system, for instance. Um, so as a result, people are confined to the car, and on average, car travel is about five times less energy efficient than, let's say, other forms of transportation like, um, like metro systems, because you have more ridership per, uh, per wagon. So that makes Hong Kong, from a transport energy um, perspective, an extremely efficient model. And... And if we think about you know, cities that keep on building highways and there's congestion and they, they're trying to solve that through building wider highways or you know, change speed limits, uh, we should realize that the point to, to, to mobility is not in and of itself. We're, we we want to be mobile because we want to access places. But we can also be closer to places uh, and increase our accessibility. And Hong Kong is an example of that. Simply by packing more people, more activities, more uses closer to another, uh, that makes that increases the accessibility of a place. So we don't need to achieve that just with mobility alone. Now, that's not to say that the Hong Kong model uh, is perfect. One key element is always in between the trans transports system like the subway station and the towers and very often it's a mall sometimes the malls are up to up to 10 stories it's really quite spectacular but in other areas it does make you wonder uh you know why is it that i'm always being forced to walk through the mall uh, and it's because um the mtrc deliberately did it that way because they want to irrigate uh, 
uh, shop fronts, as they uh, so as they say. So that's that makes uh, for uh, a city in which kind of this experience is is quite common and sometimes even preferred because uh, of the very hot and humid summers. Um, but nevertheless, it does put kind of a damper on this on this model. Um, and I, I published this book about this topic. It's, it's called Mall Mall City. Now, the second city I wanted to talk about is is New York. What's really unique about New York is how it's it's kind of outsourced outsourced plaza design with uh, high rise. So New New York City, um, of course, one of the city with the most skyscrapers after uh, Hong Kong, I believe yeah, around uh, maybe close to 1,000 1, skyscrapers. Uh, what's really special about it, in a way similar to, to Hong Kong, is that around transit nodes like Grand Central Station, there's a lot of activities. And in this case, uh, there's 1.7 million jobs just around Grand Central Station. Right? And that makes it very efficient, meaning that people can commute from outside of of Manhattan, and and once they get to Grand Central Station within 20 minutes, they're most likely able to reach their their job. So that makes for a highly efficient place. But how did the city grow, and and how did it manage to overcome some of the problems associated with skyscrapers? So one of the first triggers for increased regulation was the equitable building, and in contrast to what the the, the name of the building. It was quite a monstrosity, um, and it, it literally just extruded all the way up. Uh, and as you can see by, by the crowds on the subway uh, or in, on the sidewalk, that really led to congestion. It led to a lot of um, you know shadows and, and dark alleyways. And the city realized that something needed to be done. So one of the things they implemented was uh, kind of di diagonal sight lines. So they wanted to make sure that no matter where, where you are in the city, that you can still have uh, a direct line of sight to the sky so that you would always see the sky and that you wouldn't be in between some sort of urban, urban dark canyon. What happened with these rules is that they, they, became, they became the reality in a way, and that was a little bit scary because what happened, because the land became so precious in Manhattan, for some reason, everybody wanted to live there, is that developers just built whatever they were allowed to build. And that led to buildings like, you know, the Empire State Building, the Chrysler Building. Uh, and if that would have continued, it would have been uh, a city with just buildings and not enough public space. So what did the city do in 1961? They came up with the, an idea called the Bonus Plaza meaning that they were going to incentivize private developers to build plazas. How are they going to do that? Well, they, they were saying, okay, if you build a public plaza, then you're allowed to build higher, let's say six stories. Um, it's regulated through a mechanism called floor area ratio. But generally speaking, it was you know at least six, six stories higher. Uh, this led to lots of public plazas. In fact, uh, about 102,000 square meters of, of public open space, that's a million square feet, uh, was created uh, by the private sector. So and, and from that regard, it was a highly successful program. Unfortunately, as William White found out, um, who was a journalist and urban sociologist, he realized that a lot of these spaces were not so attractive. So I just wanted to share uh, that video with you. And what's most aggravating are the number of plazas that would be excellent for sitting if only they weren't so high or wet or had fussy little railings placed to get you right in the small of the back. Here, another two inches and you'd be comfortable. Shrubbery and canted ledges, very useful for keeping people off. But we found that people are very adaptable. Press down on your heel and you can do it. Sometimes you gotta play rough. <laughs> but as we found out, people are very adaptable. Older people like to sit in the sun here. Can't have that. Management put in these stones. And now the older people don't sit here anymore. <laughs> 
So just a, a couple of examples of what developers did to disincentivize people sitting there. Uh, but still, the city responded to that. They now have many, many rules that developers need to follow, uh, including having comfortable and convenient seating, at least one linear foot of seating for every 30 square feet of plaza. So there's many regulations that deal with planting, seating. And if you look at the most recent plazas, uh, they're very successful. So it just shows you how um, you can use the private sector to uh, incentivize certain things. So for instance, here, the one Vanderbilt, uh, which is one of the tallest towers, uh, went together with 120 million uh, improvement project into uh, public infrastructure like this public space, uh, but also this grand central concourse. So it's it's a way to upgrade uh, certain uh, pieces of the city using the private sector. Um, and this is one of the more recent examples by Norma Foster uh, that will go, get built fairly soon. So New York is interesting because of, it combines plazas with skyscrapers. Singapore is interesting because it managed to incorporate green with uh, high rise. And one of the reasons why that is the case is because uh, Singapore wanted to be uh, self-sustainable, not reliant on Malaysia for its water supply. At the same time, uh, it thought that presenting a green image would make itself very attractive to uh, businesses and, and also for, for residents. So it deliberately went to, uh, to great lengths to plant the million trees, to clean up the rivers. Uh, and this green imagery is really part of, of the city image. Now, what has it done to also make sure that tall buildings are also infused with greenery? They have a regulation called the landscape replacement area, which means that if you build in a certain area of the city, you have to replace the amount of land that you lose on the ground with greenery in the in this in the building. And sometimes that is up to you know several factors of of that uh, ground area. Uh, and you can do that for green walls or green terraces. Um, and the interesting thing about that is that they really go into quite a lot of detail in what counts as greenery. For instance, they use the LIA value or the leaf area index, which is the amount of green leaves uh, per unit of ground surface. The reason why that's important because the more greenery, uh, the more green leaves, the more benefits like photosynthesis, removing carbon dioxide, cooling, et cetera. Um, and that's why we're seeing more and more buildings like this, like the Pickering Hotel that has all these balconies with extensive greenery, uh, or here, Marina One and Oasia Hotel on the right. So what's interesting about the one on the right, it has 11 times more greenery on the sides of the building than it had lost on, on the ground, says the World Guinness Book of, of the Greenest uh, tower. And the interesting thing about Singapore is too is that it shows that high rise doesn't necessarily need to be luxury. Uh, here we're looking at uh, social housing. So Singapore is a very unique model wherein about 75% of the city's housing supply is, uh, is kind of social housing or affordable housing. Uh, and this project, the Pinnacle of Duxton, is, is one of them. And, and residents can jog you know, hundreds of feet above the city uh, on these elevated platforms. The final city I wanted to show is, um, is Vancouver. What's unique about Vancouver is that it's overcoming a, a fatal flaw of the skyscraper, which is this lack of human skill. And it does that for, for a concept that we call the tower and, and townhouse. What's so nice about Vancouver is the backdrop of mountains. Uh, but what happens when you build a lot of skyscrapers, you can no longer see that. So that was really important for, for planners that they wanted to maintain these vistas to the mountains, but also to the harbor. Uh, and this led to uh, an urban planning style we now call Vancouverism, uh, which is a combination of a slender tower that's set back from other towers and that's standing on uh, kind of a low rise block whether that is a, a townhouse or some sort of a, a shop or a restaurant. So the big problem with skyscrapers is that they tend to 
remove the contact between people when you get above the fifth floor. We can no longer distinguish people or faces, and, and it's that lack of um, like human connection that can be a problem for uh, for tall buildings. So how do they overcome that? For instance, here you have uh, a podium or a base plinth of a of a of, on the towers that are uh, kind of traditionally low-rise buildings like townhouses, and then on top of that you have the skyscrapers and a little bit set back so that you don't really even no necessarily notice them as you as you walk by. And instead, what do you notice? Like things like this, like restaurants. Um, and then the other thing about the placement of the towers is that they're always uh, set back from another minimum distance so that they're never too close to another. Uh, so that, and, and they're never too fat. They're always somewhat skinny uh, so that you always have a view in between the towers. Now, that's not to say that everywhere in the city you can see the mountains. For instance, here you, you cannot see that. So there's there's been criticism of this model also that a lot of the architecture is very uh, sterile, a lot of like glassy towers that are mostly luxury housing. Um, but nevertheless, more recently, we see kind of deviations from some of these more monotonous buildings uh, here on the left. Uh, is, a, is a tower by the Bjarke Ingels group. It has a very different profile. Uh, oh, we're already seeing this one. So the last part of the talk, I just wanted to touch briefly upon the future of the skyscraper, and then we'll talk, um, I'll take your, your questions. So what does the future hold for our, uh, for skyscrapers and cities? And of course, a lot of development has been put on a halt because of COVID uh, and, and people more and more uh, being remote. Uh, but if you look at the last you know, 100 years, the urban story is undeniable and, and human density around the world is most likely to increase. Uh, and by the UN predictions, we're expecting that uh, between now and 2050, we're going to be building the equivalent of one New York City every month for the next uh, 25 years. So that is a lot of urbanization. And a lot of this is happening um, in Asia uh, and Africa. So I believe that we will continue to see uh, skyscrapers, but maybe they're not just Kind of office uh, sky, skyscrapers, but also other uh, other th functions. Now, what makes skyscrapers for me so interesting is that they're kind of a blend of, of engineering and architecture. Uh, because when you build so tall, engineering becomes really important because the dominant force on such a tall building is uh, the wind. So you have to design around that. Uh, and it turns out that the, the best structures to, to do so uh, are, are, are structures that are kind of optimized for forces. And that brings us back to the very early cathedrals as they were built in, in France, where you have these beautiful vaulted spaces that very naturally transfer the lateral forces to the, the vertical loads of the foundation. Um, so we can see a similar evolution in in skyscraper engineering that has gone from having a lot of columns like the Empire State Building, which would be very impractical in terms of you know, having too many columns uh, that would kind of block spaces, very hard for creating larger spaces, uh, but also very expensive to build so many columns to create all these connections. So the more recent skyscrapers there, like this trust tube model, which is an exoskeleton, all the structures on the outside, and the inside is a is a hollow, um, and that is also more stable because you're putting the structure on the on the widest piece. A little bit the same principle when you're in a subway and suddenly the subway stops. You want to widen your stance, and then you're more stable. So we really see this evolution of interesting engineering ideas that are more efficient in kind of the evolution of the the tallest tower. For instance, the Burj Khalifa, which has this buttress core, that's kind of the latest, the latest model. And we also see very sophisticated analyses of wind flows and how to optimize buildings so that the wind uh, kind of flows through it or more easily flows around it so that it doesn't pull on the building. Uh, 
so we can have thinner structures uh, that are um, not as heavy. Um, but I think building tall is not, <laughs> not enough. And I, I think in today we have much bigger fish to fry than you know, trying to get to the next tallest buildings. Although it's a very interesting challenge and I myself really interested in. Uh, and there's lots of things we can use to overcome this challenge. So for instance, the tuning mass damper, for instance, which is a, a large counterweight that moves from, from left to right. And sure, you know, this challenge of building the tallest building is interesting from a technological perspective, meaning we can get uh, faster elevators uh, with the highest continuous shaft. Uh, how do we do that? It all boils down to how do we put sheetrock in the elevator core and, and how light can the elevator cable be? Um, and, you know, how do we move people from, 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 from the ground floor to different levels uh, as fast enough by clustering them in, in different parts of, um, of the elevator core. Um, and, and we will see much smarter elevators in the future. So this is a very interesting elevator that's not only able to go up and down, but also left and right and even diagonally. Um, it's called the, the multi. It doesn't go, um, it, it's, it's, it's not on a cable, it's, it's built on a magnetic reel. So that's why it can move in different directions. And this for sure will lead to, to, to different types of, of skyscrapers. Um, and it may even lead to taller buildings because there's less space that is needed for the, for the elevator core. But in the book, I also talk about how we should really go beyond building tall. And we should also think about how can we make our buildings uh, more social, avoiding kind of segregating people, uh, not only in, in cubicles, but also on, on different levels. Uh, and if you look at successful organizations, those are, especially in the knowledge economy, those are organizations that have a very interesting dynamic in terms of communication so how can you get people together? Um, how can you get people to, to interact in, in unpredicted ways? Um, so having common areas, uh, large atriums, or even mixing uses where you can have an, a tower that's always buzzing with activity, uh, even when the offices are closed or, or people are away from home by having these different uses in the project. Uh, how can we have towers that have more uh, open spaces where people can be uh, together outside. Um, towers that have more greenery, for instance, here uh, in this project in Amsterdam, the valley that was recently completed that has several plazas uh, on different levels. And this is done by NBRDV. But perhaps most importantly, how can we build towers without uh, putting such a strain on the environment? So yes, building tall is good because it frees up space for other purposes like, uh, like recreational land or agriculture. But at the same time, it has more structure and more energy for elevators. If you're looking at the global carbon emissions, 40% of that stems from building. Two thirds of that is for cooling, heating, and lighting, uh, all the energy to operate the building. But one, one third of that is all the materials, concrete and steel, which weigh very heavily on the planet. So how can we reduce that? Um, and how can we make our, our towers more connected with public transportation so that we do not need to drive and look for, uh, for parking? How can we avoid just glass towers? So glass towers or, or glass boxes are great for growing tomatoes. Uh, in greenhouses, but they're not so much for, for people uh, because they heat up and, and they even need air conditioning in winter. So more and more we're seeing projects that move away from pure glass with ceramics, for instance, that still have a very beautiful kind of crystalline aesthetic, but not necessarily need to be all glass. And glass is also a very bad insulator. Uh, so, so having more other types of, of material like ceramics is, is very good. And how do we uh, go away from the, kind of the naked glass box, but also have more shading so that we can reduce the amount of radiation of the sun um, as it beams its rays on the building. Uh, again, 
making us very dependent on air conditioning. So we're seeing lots of interesting innovations, including this uh, interactive facade that, uh, that goes open and close depending on people walking around, but also on, on the position of the sun. Or using natural ventilation, the ability to open a window, or simply for having a very large uh, indoor uh, channel that helps suck out all the, uh, all the hot air through the chimney effect without using any energy. Uh, so things like that will help us reduce the operational energy, the energy we use for cooling and heating. But how do we reduce the energy related to building materials? How do we reduce our dependency on concrete? But one of the most exciting answers is mass timber, uh, which is an engineered form of wood that performs uh, relatively well uh, and is a very good acoustic and thermal insulator. Uh, but the beauty of mass timber is that it's a regenerative material. So when we take uh, a tree out of the forest, we can plant a new tree and we do not deplete it. On top of that, it, it uh, absorbs carbon from the atmosphere. So instead of uh, a carbon source like cement, it can be a carbon sink. So we would be storing carbon um, inside buildings. And we're seeing taller buildings that are integrated uh, with greenery, but also uh, built out of mass timber. Uh, and personally, this is the area I'm most excited about. And I'm working on this with several projects and, and students. Um, and I really believe that, uh, you know, as we build, build taller, uh, we should also think about the city down on the ground. And I don't think uh, we should continue <laughs> just purely thinking about height, uh, but there's other things that are now more and more important, like, you know, who's going to build the greenest building uh, or the most social building or the city or the, the building with the most affordable units. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. If you're interested in the book, it has uh, about 36 original drawings, some of them which you saw in the lecture. Um, and uh, one of the big themes is how, if you look at the history of technology, there's always uh, a lot of innovation and, and new technologies that help us, but there's always kind of a problem that comes associated with it. So it goes back to Prometheus, who was seen as the first engineer uh, who, who brought fire to the to, on Earth. He, gave, he gifted it to humans, but then he was punished by the gods and, and they brought Pandora's box, which opened the whole... Uh, can of worms, I should say, uh, and, and and you know that that theme of uh, innovation on one hand and new technology, but at the same time, uh, the problems associated with that and how do we overcome them is is a big line through the book. So uh, I'll pause here, and I'm very excited to uh, answer your questions. Thank you, Stefan. That was an extremely interesting presentation. I wanted to start um, and just touch upon, um, you talked about the landscape replacement policy in Singapore. Is there, uh, are there any efforts or policies to make um, buildings more green and sustainable in the US? Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's, in, in New York, for instance, there's a handful of, um, of uh, initiatives. One of them is called uh, Local Law 97, which was passed a couple of years ago which for the first time in history is putting a cap on carbon emissions. So up until now, um, we don't really regulate carbon emissions in the built environments. The only thing that we have is the energy code, which means that if you want to build a building, then you need to submit plans to the, to the government and they're, you know, the building officials, they're going to look at you know, how well do you insulate your facade, for instance. They're not going to count how much carbon you're actually using. So this law will put a cap on the amount of carbon emissions. And if you go beyond that, you have to pay fines. So that's really causing a big change um, in New York City in terms of you know, making buildings more uh, energy efficient. So a lot of recladding of buildings uh, are, are happening now to kind of insulate them better so that they don't use as much energy. The other, if, uh, the, uh, the other policy has to do with green roofs. 
and adding photovoltaics. So there's several policies in place that uh, that make sure that uh, you know when a, when it's possible on a roof, when it's big enough or flat enough that there should be greenery uh, or photovoltaics. So so New York is a good example, but there's other good examples like Chicago, the home of the skyscrapers. Uh, the city has been very proactive in, in adding green roofs to buildings, including City Hall. Um, so there's a lot of positive examples. I would say the most groundbreaking examples are probably in Europe, uh, particularly like the UK and, and France, where they're implementing life cycle assessments on buildings, which means that for the first time, when you put up a building, you need to account for all the materials that you're going to be uh, using and, and trying to minimize all the energy created to kind of the whole building process. So thinking about, okay, what's going to happen at the end of the building's life cycle? Or how can we reduce the amount of new materials and have more recycled materials or bio-based materials? So those are very far-reaching policies that are still at their infancy, but they will require architects to fundamentally rethink the way in which they've been designing buildings with concrete and cement for so long. Uh, so that's really going to cause a very big shift in how we think about uh, architecture and buildings. Great, thank you. And um, you talked about um, using mass timber to create um, taller buildings down instead of using more concrete. Um, what is the cost difference in terms of um, using timber versus concrete and how durable is um, a building made out of mass timber versus obviously concrete? Yeah, the, I mean, it, the cost difference is a little bit hard because it depends on uh, whether the material is, is local, if it needs to be shipped. Um, and, you know, lumber prices have gone up a lot, but they're also now back down. Um, what's interesting about mass timber is because it's about a fifth lighter than concrete and steel, it, a lot of it can be prefabricated in factories uh, and used, you know, with complicated machinery and then shipped to the site where it's assembled. And this really reduces construction time. So that can be very economically efficient. Now, in terms of the durability, it's, it's obviously not as strong as, as concrete or steel. Um, however, uh, the the nice thing about it is that it's much lighter, so you can really um, kind of re reduce the amount of structure that you need because your building overall is uh, is a lot lighter. And then it performs quite well under fire because um, what happens as it chars, as it, as it as it burns, it's chars, and this thick layer of char is like a dense uh, layer of carbon that will hold the fire, fire, it will slow it down. Uh, so so that's, um, that's positive. Um, so, so recently the International Building Code, they're now allowing uh, tall buildings also out of mass timber. Previously, you weren't allowed to build taller than five stories, uh, but since a couple of years, you can go up to 18 stories and some countries like in Scandinavia, the building, uh, mass timber buildings that are even taller than that. Are they going to get much taller than 30 stories? Probably not by themselves. Um, I think when you get to that tall, you probably need to combine it, create a composite material of, of partially timber and partially uh, concrete, for instance. Uh, but for building up to 30 stories, it's feasible. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a question. In your chart, Paris and Boston had similar densities, but Boston was much worse on transportation. Are there examples of communities that limit development until public transportation is in place? Yeah, um, Portland is a very good example. So Portland, Oregon, uh, they deliberately um, established what we call transit-oriented developments meaning new development around public transportation. So they revitalized their uh, tram network, for instance, uh, and around those tr tram stops and tram lines, they built taller. Uh, and on top of that, what they did is they established a growth boundary, which, which means that the city is not allowed to sprawl further. It's, it sets a boundary around the city and they're not allowed to build built outward. They have to kind of 
um, absorb the population growth within those boundaries. Uh, so that's a very good example. There's other good examples um, in, in, in Europe, in Asia, in Latin America. So, so for instance, uh, Curitiba in Brazil, which, which is um, a, a city that is laid out around bus rapid transport. So instead of building subway lines, which are very expensive, they built on ground a bus system that kind of looks like a train, but it's not, and it's 10 times cheaper than building a subway, but it can be highly efficient in moving people around. Uh, and then combined with this bus network, they densified around those lines. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of examples. It's, it's a big concept that has been around for a while, but the last 20 years really got quite popular. But the city that kind of embodies it most is really the city of Hong Kong. Thank you. Um, I have another question. Could you speak more about mixed use in the vertical space? The Vancouver concept interests me. I lived in Germany and there is more mixed use there. In the US, we tend to separate our purposes. One that idea I've been thinking about has to do with going vertically on places like Walmart. People would have access to most of their shopping needs. For an aging population, this may be worthwhile. I'm not promoting Walmart, I'm just considered the symbiotic relationship of purpose and needs. Yeah, I mean, traditionally cities grew mixed use. Uh, when, you, when you think about it, look at all the old medieval cities, you have, uh, when you go to the old core, you have uh, shop fronts. And then on top of that, you have very often residences. And this goes back to, even Roman apartment buildings. So the idea of mixed use uh, comes very organically. And in a way, it makes a lot of sense because you want to have everything nearby, right? You're, you're, you want to buy your bread nearby. You want to be able to walk. Now, there's two things that really changed all of that. And, uh, you know, one of them is the idea of segregating uses, which comes from modern, modern city planning. But the other thing, and that's really something that has a, had a major impact in the United States, is the advent of the car. So by the time uh, the mass production of the car happened in the United States, uh, we also see a very large uh, suburban impulse. And, and the United States became, became very long a kind of a suburban country where the majority of people lived in suburbs. And, and that was really on the based on the idea also of separating, right? You had residential suburbs, and then you would drive to uh, your office complex or or to the city, and you would shop in a in a different area. And, and now we realize that this was probably a, a mistake. Although I do realize that in the United States are also more dense forms of of suburbia that are walkable and that have you know a downtown mixed use center. Um, so, so the same happened in skyscrapers. You know, many skyscrapers are mono use uh, that are just pure offices or pure residential. But for instance, if you look at what happens uh, during COVID in New York, Midtown, which is predominantly office, became a ghost town because the, there's not much else there. Um, so, so for uh, a vibrant community, you really want to have a mixed use. And you also want that for uh, a building whenever possible, uh, because first of all, it, 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 it means different in income streams for developers. But secondly, it means that the building is used during different times of the day. So it's more of efficient. For instance, you know, the office space would just be used during the day, but then at night it would be a ghost town. But if you combine that with, you know, restaurants on the ground floor or a hotel or even residential, then it will be more active around the clock. So the same benefits you have, you know, down on the streets below of mixing uses, you can also use those within tall buildings. And we're seeing that it's a real trend that's happening where more and more skyscrapers are becoming mixed use. Another trend that's happening is less and less skyscrapers are office buildings, but more residential. Um, so that's all really changing how we think about tall buildings. Great. And so what do you foresee as the next trend moving forward? You um, have designed the twisted towers, the leaning, the eroding towers, sky bridges. 
and the super slenders. What do you think is next in terms of like tower design? Yeah, so I'm really most excited about timber and more sustainable buildings. Um, the 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 built environment is is a major culprit in terms of climate change, with forty percent of the carbon emissions stemming from buildings. Um, so we really need to change how we think about, you know, creating buildings and using materials that are are really taxing on our planet. So I think that's the that's the biggest challenge. And as an architect, you kind of have this Hippocratic oath of also improving uh, society and, and, you know, leaving the world behind a little better than, than it was. And it's kind of that responsibility that is also part of the, of the job. So uh, for me, that's the major, major challenge. So how can we design in such a way that we can also, uh, we, we don't kind of strain the environment. Fabulous. So we are out of time. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, Stefan. And My thank pleasure. you everyone for joining us. Have a yeah, wonderful evening. You.